Thank you. Good morning. My name is Wulandari. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, PT Nirwana Sagara. is the processor and exporter of pasteurized crab meat uh, with the species blue swimming crab. Uh, it's a wild caught fisheries. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Hema. I'm founder and managing director of my company, Bali Sustainable Seafood. So we are distributor of uh, seafood product for hotel, restaurant, and direct to customer too. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. My name is Angga Nugraha. I'm working for the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries in Indonesia. So I'm dealing with the fisheries. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Amrullah Usimau. You can call me Amar. Uh, I'm a representative of uh, Indonesian Fisheries Undergraduate Association. My position is Deputy Secretary General 3. Our member consists of uh, academics, uh, practitioner, uh, politician, and fishery actors. Uh, my organization uh, focus for providing assistance, uh, mentoring, uh, improvement, and advocacy for fishermen. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is Utari. I am co-founder and chief sustainability officer of Aruna. Aruna is uh, integrated fisheries commerce. Uh, we connecting small scale fishers uh, and connect them to global market with the technology. Thank you. Okay. Good. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sanki Irawan. I am the chief of research, community service, and quality assurance in my, my university. My university is uh, Raja Ali Haji Maritime University. So we are the first maritime university in Indonesia, and now we're still the only one university. So uh, sustainability, especially what you have in uh, New Hampshire, like this fish and game, will be uh, part of my interest. So. If I learn today, maybe I can adapt something in my country in the future. Thank you. Good morning. Representative Jeff Goley, uh, representing Manchester, um, Vice Chair of the Fish and Game Committee. And I am Chairman James mm -hmm. Blaine, uh, Chairman of the Fish and Game Committee. Uh, I'm on my fifth term here in the State House, which is our terms are two years, so that's uh, into my ninth and tenth year. Um, as uh, in my my private life, I'm a senior technical writer for uh, an industrial tools company, and then uh, Fish and Game is my focus here in the State House. Okay, good morning. I am Carol Brown. Uh, this is my first term here in the legislature. I'm learning my way. Uh, I'm a biologist by education. Um, when I, I worked for the state of New Hampshire for the Department of Environmental Services, and my main uh, job there the last 16 years was working in oil spill preparedness on the coast of New Hampshire and working closely with Chief Patterson from Fish and Game on uh, preparations for oil and wildlife and how do we protect oyster farms and how do we protect our lobster fisheries if there is a spill. Thank you. Good morning. Representative Paul Tudor, uh, Rockingham One, serving the towns of Northwood and Nottingham. This is my second term as a New Hampshire State Rep, my first term on fish and game. Uh, I'm a retired mechanical engineer from General Electric. As a matter of fact, I spent probably about four months in Bandung, Indonesia in the 90s, uh, setting up uh, uh, jet engine test facilities there for the CN-235 program. Uh, had a great time there. I was in and out of the country three or four times, probably a month each, but I uh, really enjoyed my time there. Good morning. My name is Mike Willett. I uh, am a representative first term from Colebrook up in the north country of New Hampshire. In my professional life, I am a heavy equipment sales representative and a, uh, a lifelong outdoor enthusiast. Good morning, uh, Representative Ben Ming, uh, first term state rep representing the town of Hollis, uh, which is right on the Massachusetts border. Um, I stepped back from my professional life of uh, being a lawyer to 
be at home with my four kids and learning a lot in this committee. Great, thank you. Good morning and welcome. I'm Cherie Patterson, the Chief of Marine Fisheries for the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. Um, I'm not gonna say how many years I have been here. It's been way too long, uh, but thoroughly enjoyable and I look forward to uh, this interaction. Thank you. So how would we like to start? Do we have any questions for the committee first? Would you like to hear about um, interesting initiatives or maybe we could even have the Fish and Game Marine Department uh, go over a, uh, a recap and an overview of how our state runs our um, aquaculture and, and uh, wild caught marine stuff? You wanna hear? We want to hear first. Okay. Good, all right, well, we'll start with you, Sheree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hello again. Okay. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, an overview of how New Hampshire um, maintains sustainable fisheries, is that is that what you guys wanna hear, essentially? It, um, the, d the department is generally um, for, let's put it this way, coastal fisheries are, are in large part migratory. Based on that, the rules and regulations that are created to maintain sustainable fisheries are uh, two part, actually three part. The first part is um, the Magnuson-Stevens uh, Fisheries Conservation Act. It uh, was voted in back in the 70s and has been through many uh, amendments since then. And what it does is it allows um, is guidance and some regulations as to how to effectively maintain uh, sustainable fisheries. What this act does is also it creates a series of coastal councils that work with the industry, uh, works with the states to come up with rules and regulations on um, based on fishery management plans and based on science as to how to maintain uh, sustainable fisheries. It um, also has um, an integral part of national standards that will be inclusive of the industry and still maintaining conservation needs, based, again, based on science. So we have a New England Fisheries Management Council a Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council and a South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council that covers federal waters, which are waters beyond three miles out to 200. State waters is zero to three miles. And it's the councils, uh, and, and I'm just saying those three councils cover the Atlantic coast. Uh, we also have a governing body with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that deals with fisheries within those state water boundaries, zero to three miles. So what guides New Hampshire is these two um, organizations, governing organizations, the New England Fisheries Management Council and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that have... Um, divided up, so to, so to speak, depending on the life cycles of these uh, fisheries, 
fish and fisheries to um, create fisheries management plans. And each year or each three or five years, these fishery management plans are updated with science through stock assessments and such. When there comes time where decisions need to be made to adjust these fishery management plans is when these organizations, ASMFC and New England Fisheries Management Council, get together and uh, vote as a body. So Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is comprised of, uh, of the voting body from Maine down through Florida. The New England Fisheries Management Council um, governs from Connecticut up through Maine. And again, their, their boundaries are three miles to 200 or zero to three miles. Once we uh, make decisions based on stock assessments and updating these fishery management plans is when we come back to our state waters or our state body and um, present rules or regulations to be voted through to continue to maintain these sustainable fisheries. So sometimes on an annual basis, I will come before this body to um, talk about how to move forward with some rules and regulations as well as we listen to this body, um, if they have thoughts on how they would like to see additional conservation measures or additional measures to maintain sustainable fisheries within our state waters. So that's kind of a quick recap. Is there any questions? I would like to ask if you could go into explaining the species that we have here as our, our common species, because I'm sure that it differs from what they're doing in Indonesia, and they might be interested to know what we're, our fisheries are actually uh, bringing in um, and, and what our major species are and our subspecies, and even some of the things we're doing with aquaculture, such as the, uh, the, oysters. the uh, oysters. Okay. oysters. So. Red as go. Um, so our in New Hampshire, our primary uh, economically viable fishery is the American lobster fishery. That is um, that is what what is coming in with our largest uh, landings and our largest um, economic viability to our coastline. We also, um, again, these fisheries are prosecuted not just within state waters, but also within federal waters, that they um, are allowed to come in and land from federal waters. We also have groundfish fisheries. Um, our groundfish complex consists of um, cod, pollock, hake, those sort of um, species that are midwater dwelling species. Um, we also have flounders. We have your typical um, saltwater species that are found along the Atlantic coast and that migrate. Um, as uh, Chairman Splain indicated, um, we also have our species within state waters that really don't move around much, like oysters and clams and such. So for um, our, our more sedentary species that aren't migratory, we have found that it's difficult to be able to uh, sustain viable fisheries because there's such a huge population of people that um, certainly are drawn to harvest these species. And so a lot of times with, um, in these conditions, we just allow residents to be able to harvest under certain conditions and such so that we don't have an over harvest issue. However, um, due to climate change and due to just interest in general of harvesting these species, um, 
there has been encouragement for aquaculture to occur. So in New Hampshire, currently, our primary aquaculture species are oysters. We also have mussels, um, mussel lines. We have kelp lines. We have a small research also aquaculture communities that are researching how to um, raise trout or sea run trout or salmon or these sort of species also. But our major uh, focus for aquaculture in state waters is uh, the oyster species. Thank you. Great. Um, does anyone here want to add on to anything as far as uh, concerns and or uh, sportsman situations, maybe even touch on the bill that we did have this year on the lobster cleanup uh, situation. Okay. I just have one quick statement and fishing game. There are uh, a very diversified organization. They'll have a section of fishing game who is really focused on law enforcement, but they also have a, a section that is biologists that are really taking care of the species and the animals in the area. So they, they have uh, wear varied hats. Right. And is there interest in the freshwater stuff that we do as well, or are we focusing mainly on marine species? Freshwater as well? So I could toss this back to Cherie again to talk about our freshwater program. And uh, we do we do raise uh, fish that we then release, in, and uh, that keeps the sportsmen able to go. We don't have any freshwater industry that I know of, uh, but we have the sportsmen. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, for the most part, that's correct. We have small bait fisheries um, that are that can be on a commercial basis, but for the most part, our inland fisheries uh, revolve around uh, cold water species and warm water species. So you have your cold water species, which are primarily your trout. We have uh, brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout. And uh, warm water species such as your bass, your various bass, your perch, and such. So again, um, we're a small state and yet have a population that's very interested in recreating for these species. So um, we have, I'm not sure if I've got this number correct. Um, I know we used to have seven hatcheries. I'm not sure we still have seven. I thought there were five, five right now. now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, that raise uh, the, the various uh, trout that I just mentioned, as well as uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon. So these are, um, for the trout, it's primarily a put-and-take fishery. We raise them up to be a... Um, harvestable size or an exciting size for recreational harvesters to, to angle for. And um, we do we do release uh, fingerlings, you know, your small species in some of our our higher elevation ponds and such uh, to give that um, excitement also for recreational anglers to be able to harvest um, if they decide to hike in. Uh, distances to do that sort of fishing. We uh, do not have any hatcheries for our warm water species. We just make sure that we have rules or regulations in place that will um, reduce the amount of harvest per person to make sure that these species are maintained sustainably. Thank you. Vice Chair. Can you just go over briefly, because I think it's important, an important issue as well, when we talk about conservation and how we can conserve uh, our fisheries, uh, striped bass. I know there was just an area that was closed recently due to um, a die-off of fish being killed after being released. I just want to talk about how we manage that species. So our striped bass uh, species are a migratory species, and they are managed through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. 
Um, they right now are in a um, period of um, o being overfished, over, um, and overfishing was occurring. So the minute those categories popped up in front of us at, at the ASMFC level, uh, that put us into creating a 10-year recovery plan. Uh, we're not recovering very well. So what has happened is um, probably due to climate change, we don't have good recruitment occurring. And warmer waters are definitely affecting um, how the fish react to being under stress. So if they're being harvested a lot, if they're being angled, uh, fished on a lot, catch and release sort of scenario in warm waters, um, then they will start dying. So the state of Maine just recently closed uh, the Saco River due to this sort of event. We had uh, striped bass that were, or Maine had striped bass that were in their rivers that were being heavily fished. A lot of catch and release, the waters were warming up, and then they were noticing that there was uh, dead fish that were um, at, a, at a higher quantity than what we want to see during a period of time that we're trying to recover this, um, this particular population to be more sustainable. Carol Brown. I, I don't know uh, how it works for you folks. So the, there's always a question here about sustainability as driven by our federal government versus the rights of fishermen and earning their livelihoods. So I don't know. I, I don't know if Sharia wanted to touch base on that. Certainly controlling how fishermen operate leads into the sustainability of the fishery, but it also always has some impact on uh, those people's uh, livelihood. So I, I'd be interested to know how it works on, on this side. Yeah, thank you for the question. So we have the same facing, we, we are facing the same problem, you know, in Indonesia as well. So uh, the uh, fishermen need and the scientist needs is uh, something like the opposite direction, you know. The fishermen want more fish, but the, scient the scientists, are, oh no, you cannot catch more fish, but you have to preserve the resource. So sometimes we have, yeah option between that then we take the uh what we call it. it's not like the win-win solution but uh we have to choose the best option for that to preserve the resource even uh it's hurt the fisherman maybe you know i know maybe in here it's it, it happened as well and then when we take uh we create the policy or regulation to, uh, to manage our fisheries but maybe it will not be uh, we, it will not good for the fisherman sometimes yeah. Thank you. I'll go again if you want. Absolutely. Uh, on the, the handout here, it talks about, uh, it says to broaden understanding with a wider range of ad advocacy tools and mechanisms, et cetera. So uh, Chief Patterson can speak to this much better than I can, but there are a number of efforts uh, in the state of New Hampshire and Maine where volunteer groups come together and, and and advocate they'll come here to testify to this committee to advocate for a position and uh, i think it's a really important part of of how this works in new hampshire uh, as the the chairman mentioned a short time ago this past year this past three years five years or <laughs> uh, there was a a bill proposed to allow scuba divers to harvest lobsters by hand from the bottom. And it was very controversial. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about the, the sustainability of the lobster fishery and would it impact that. And it, it came down to quite a conversation in here. So 
Um, but Chief Patterson might be able to better talk about sort of those advocacy kind of programs and the volunteer efforts that happen. But it's a it's a really big part of I think how how New Hampshire operates um, fish and game. I'll put a plug in for they are unfortunately generally underfunded. I don't know if the same thing happens on your side. But. And I guess I'll follow up on that with um, more information about this bill that we had that we dealt with. Uh, mostly, we still have some cleanup to do on it, but it should be going into effect after the Senate took a, a stab at doing some changes to it. Uh, one of the things that came out of this whole discussion on allowing divers to go down for lobsters was that the divers were seeing a lot of um, what we call ghost traps. These are fishing traps that have become separated from their line and are now at the whims of the ocean getting tangled up in balls, but they still continue to catch animals that crawl into them that then die and become bait to attract more animals. And so it's difficult to... Uh, work again, uh, work for your sustainability. If you've got fishing traps that are fishing without anybody being in charge of them underwater. So we needed to come up with a way to identify their locations and clean them up. And we're a little late coming to the game compared to a state like Maine. Maine just to our north has a lot more lobster fishermen. And they have a much bigger problem with the traps that have become separated. And so they started a cleanup program um, that was done by a volunteer organization working in conjunction with the lobstermen just in the Booth Bay Harbor area alone, where they were able to pull out and remove thousands of traps that had been found washed up in areas where they were underwater, wrapped in balls. And um, most of them were recycled, but some of them were still in condition where they could be returned to their owners and and refurbished and put back in the water. Um, but that cleanup is one of the things that we now have an active bill uh, with potentially some money allocated to help with the cleanup of that and push ourselves towards trying to remove these underwater uh, ghost traps so that they aren't continually catching species. And we have photos that it's not just the lobsters that crawl into these lobster traps. We have pictures of some cod that were inside and trapped and can't get out and um, all kinds of things. Um, so uh, that's another aspect where we're working on on uh, trying to trying to be working hand in hand with the lobstermen. We've got a little bit of a harder time convincing them that it's a problem they need to deal with than Maine did. Maine, they were all right on board, jumped on onto it. And when he says this was controversial, there was a lot of arguing between the lobstermen and the divers and the environmental groups about how big is this problem really? Um, of course, at first, the lobstermen didn't want to say the problem even existed. It doesn't happen to us. Um, but we've got the issue currently being solved in Massachusetts and Maine. How could we be different, right? Um, and when we had pictures brought up from the ocean bottom that showed them, we know there's a problem. How extensive that problem is, we still don't know. We need a study to see how many traps are down there, where they're located, and, and how big of a problem it is. But we've got a, a step forward now with this bill where we're going to allocate some funding and try to start to recognize the problem and address it. Um, and then I guess I'll toss it back to Cherie now so she can add more context to anything that uh, we've touched on. Uh, thank you. I love this hot topics. Um, so as uh, many countries and um, ours included, ghost gear has been a severe problem, not just with, in this case, lobster traps, but also nets. Um, we don't see too much of that in our state waters with nets because uh, we have a pretty um, tightly regulated uh, way of being able to fish or you can't fish uh, using nets. A lot of times it's you have to be actively fishing a net. You have to be on site. Um, we don't allow most mobile gear in our state waters. So yes, our probably our primary um, ghost gear issue is the lobster gear. Uh, we've decided to come at it uh, many years ago from a many-pronged approach. 
which unfortunately um, has not been inclusive of in-water gear. So our mini-prong approach started out with doing a beach cleanup. So the lobster fishing industry for um, over 20 years has been, uh, with the help of Fish and Game, organizing a beach cleanup time frame. So usually after a winter where we have uh, storms and such, you see a lot of gear that will come up onto the coast and that is cleaned up before the uh, the summer residents start to show up. And then we uh, entered into an MOA with um, another state agency who is responsible for state parks and such so that they are also allowed to now pick up uh, gear that are on the beach or uh, in shallow water that they may find that would be interrupting uh, people recreating in state parks and such. Keeping in mind that for lobster gear, uh, we have a regulation that indicates that essentially only uh, a member of law enforcement or um, fish and game designee person or um, a lobster harvester themselves can only uh, pick up gear. It's considered private property here, and therefore it's pretty constrained as to who can actually pick up um, gear that appears to be uh, ghost gear or derelict gear. The next uh, manner of approaching this was being able to provide a way of disposing of gear uh, for the various fishing industries. We were uh, informed that many town municipality uh, disposal or dumps were not were no longer taking uh, fishing gear, and this then kind of promoted a out of sight, out of mind thought from the fishing industry that if they just go dump it out in the water, you don't you don't see it again. So what we did is we created these, um, what we call fishing for energy bins uh, and opportunities such that any uh, person in the fishing industry can uh, dump particular things into this fishing for energy bin. And where it, it goes is um, a company called Covanta in Massachusetts that will burn uh, particular gear types, or it'll go to um, snitcher steel, in other words, your lobster traps and such, which are metal uh, for recycling. So it's a complete recycling program at this point in time that the fishing industry has been um, utilizing to its full extent. They do bring in gear that they will no longer be using um, and it and it doesn't end up in places that it shouldn't end up in if it's no longer viable gear. We also, um, in, in our travels of picking up gear off the coast and such, if, the, if it is viable gear, we will contact the individuals. Uh, they all have to have some sort of identification on their gear. Uh, we notify them and we give them the opportunity of two weeks to come and pick it up. If they don't pick it up, then it goes into the recycling bin and it's and it's gone. Um, and so now with um, this year's help with uh, the legislative process and this committee, uh, we should be able to obtain some funds to be able to now work with gear that is in the water. As you can imagine, it's very hard to locate gear that's in water. If it's in shallow water, that's a little bit easier, but you know we have um, certainly more deep waters where uh, it would be harder to be able to detect where gear, derelict gear is and such. Without technology such as side scan sonar, um, as just an example, to be able to find where this gear is. 
We have encouraged um, communities that, um, such as the diving community and such, to give us a call if they find a, a ball of gear so that we can um, find it and recover it um, as a fishing game agency, or we have actually um, had Coast Guard help us a couple times with some big balls, and they had a big bigger ship than ours to be able to recover um, these gears. And again, we will do similar to what we do with all recovered gear. If it looks like it's a viable gear, we'll contact the owner. If not, then it goes to the recycling bin and such. So that's where we are with this many pronged approach to try and deal with um, and prevent derelict gear and ghost gear. Thanks. And touching on that, um, I was wondering if you could also explain the um, the depths of water that we have off of our coastline, because I know it does drop off precipitously and quickly past the Isle of Shoals, but we've got lots of shallow area between here and there, and where Indonesia's a mostly island country, they probably have a lot of familiarity with the way that we have a relationship with the Isle of Shoals and things get fished in between, but then we've got the deep water as well. Um, and I'm not familiar enough with how our depths vary to get into that part. So New Hampshire's coastline is, um, is complex habitat. It has got a variety of rocky um, areas, got rocky shoreline, we have beaches, we have sandy areas, we have muddy areas. Uh, when I had described earlier about state waters being between zero and three miles, that also encompasses if you're going around islands. So we have a series of islands off of our coast called the Isles of Shoals. And um, it's pretty much split in half between New Hampshire and the state of Maine. But you also, when you talk about state waters, you're also talking about those three miles around um, islands also. So we do have um, varying depths, you know, of course, from the shoreline. Um, we have depths out by the shoals that are at 60 feet. And then we also can drop down to 200 feet um, in various areas, both between our shoreline and the shoals as well as beyond the shoals. So it, it becomes a little bit um, tenuous as to how you can identify where, where gear might be and how um, varied the, the recovery of gear will have to be um, considered when, when we are able to find this uh, ghost and derelict gear. Great, anybody else? Uh, Carol. I see that on Wednesday, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I see that on Wednesday, you're going to the Nashua National Fish Hatchery. You can, re you can help me because my, my knowledge is old. Have they abandoned the salmon program? So for years, uh, I, how many years and how much money was spent in the attempt to bring migratory salmon back into the rivers of New Hampshire? And I think the federal government was the main driver of that but they used to do that from that hatchery but i didn't know if you could address if that's a, as a failed program <laughs> so um very good question um it, it's the the federal agencies um and state agencies that try and work in concert to uh, restore fisheries um, or provide uh, other sustainable ways of harvesting fisheries. Um, for example, our hatcheries with trout. So decades ago, in the 70s, probably even 60s, uh, there was a um, clear understanding that the Atlantic salmon so you have landlocked Atlantic salmon, literally those are landlocked in our lakes and such, and you have the migratory Atlantic salmon. In our major uh, coastal rivers between Connecticut and Maine, it was determined that these anadromous species that um, 
live most of their lives in salt water, but come into fresh water to spawn and they spend for Atlantic salmon, they'll spend two years in fresh water before they migrate back out to the ocean. So we weren't seeing the returns coming back to um, our freshwater reaches of their habitat. Of course, these freshwater reaches have been uh, severely truncated by dams. And most of these dams um, up until the 60s and 70s had no fish passage on them. And even now there's very little fish passage on most of the dams that are within the Atlantic salmon's um, reach or within their, their cycle, their migratory cycle. So uh, Connecticut was the first to really detect an issue with a declining Atlantic salmon population in their river systems. Of course, um, as you can imagine, climate change has been occurring for decades. It is something that just occurs recently. It's occurring over decades. And you have some key species that might be the canary in the mine. They might be the detectors that there are changes that are occurring. And in Connecticut, it was determined that there was um, that was the southernmost reach at the time of the Atlantic salmon. The Atlantic salmon, again, go from, on the Atlantic coast, um, go from Connecticut or did right up through into Canada. So there was a, a federal push to try and restore the Atlantic salmon back into some of these rivers. And it started out in Massachusetts and Connecticut um, where they started putting in fish passage systems in dams and had hatcheries both in Vermont and in, um, we had a small one in New Hampshire, have a small one in New Hampshire, the Nashua uh, National Fish Hatchery where we were, uh, or the feds were uh, raising the juveniles and stocking them out into the ocean so that they were kind of skipping that, that in freshwater reach of their life cycle uh, in order to try and be more viable considering the freshwater um, habitat was not very hospitable to them. And then all of a sudden you just kind of started to see this creek going north of the Atlantic salmon in northern rivers um, from the Connecticut River also start experiencing this concern of uh, diminished populations of Atlantic salmon. So in the 90s, um, it was determined that the Inland or the freshwater habitats were going to continue not to be hospitable for the Atlantic salmon uh, population in those particular river reaches. And the uh, federal government that had these hatcheries, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, decided to change species raising different species that would be more of a uh, viable fishery to be able to restore. So right now the uh, Nashua hatchery is raising American shad <laughs> for the Connecticut and the Merrimack uh, rivers. And when they have some extra, they get we get uh, some of those extra juveniles also to stock in our freshwater reaches and American shad or anadromous species also. They'll go out to the ocean and uh, come around when they come back when they decide they are ready to spawn. Thank you. Anything else from my committee members? Uh, Chairman Spielen, if you don't mind. Yep. Our feasters have a lot of questions they would like to ask if you could give them time. Absolutely. We're. So, uh, we're, I was going to go right over to them, actually, if, if there was no other comments from the from the side here. But I'll let Ben Ming do one question, and then we'll pop right over there. Just very briefly to um, 
your your earlier question of ocean depth, maybe it might be useful to talk about um, water temperatures because we have, I don't know, two or three months of hot weather, but our ocean water tends to be fairly cold. Anybody who tries to swim around here knows that. However, it is getting warmer. Uh, the Gulf of Maine is actually one of the fastest warming uh, waters in the world today. Uh, there is a, a pinching, so to speak, of colder Arctic waters and our warmer Gulf waters that is occurring. And as a result of that, uh, we're not getting the colder uh, waters coming into the Gulf of Maine from the Arctic that we uh, used to. So as a result, we are experiencing um, a lot warmer water, um, which has effects of all of the uh, trophic levels of species. So, you know, right down to your benthic species, your copepods, which feed our whales, for example, um, or some species of our whales. And um, shrimp, northern shrimp, we no longer have a fishery for northern shrimp because, again, the, the waters are too warm and inhospitable to maintain um, viable fishing uh, opportunities for those populations. Again, these are some of these species are canaries in the mine, and um, we're just going to be adapting to these sort of conditions over the next uh, several decades, or at least until the next mini ice age occurs. Okay, let's turn it over to your first questions. I'll let uh, you guys choose who gets to speak and uh, we'll be listening. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so we have a lot of questions, but I try to simplify the question. So uh, we want to know uh, how do you establish the policy, the policy, maybe uh, a step behind uh, you creating the policy, you know, uh, managing the fisheries, uh, limited resources, and you have to distribute uh, fairly and equally among the fisheries, you know. So we want to know, uh, how do you set the policy uh, for the some issues? And then uh, what is the role of the representative in here to, you know, to affect the policy? And then whether is it a political issue for the, to, to affect the uh, decision or the policy? Thank you. So as Cherie had mentioned, there's um, two governing bodies that that uh, help set the policy for the entire Atlantic seacoast and then for our northern states. Um, the federal government has a lot of uh, say over everything that has to happen along our whole Atlantic coast at the um, at, at the uh, federal waters which was the three miles and out. And then for us, the zero to three miles in is uh, more of what we get to control as a state, but we also still have to follow under the guidance of that Atlantic States uh, Fishing Council. Um, when an issue comes up that is something that we need to address in our state, such as this derelict fishing gear, because it was being addressed in Maine and in Massachusetts, but we hadn't really done anything regarding the gear in water, I want to make that clear. We had a successful program once it washes up on shore, but for everything that remains hidden underwater, um, we didn't have a program, but it became an issue that we had to deal with with our state itself. So that's when it comes to an, our body to make a legislative decision on trying to find the best way to put forward a regulation that uh, must be adhered to for our bodies of water along the ocean. Um, anything that happens in the fresh water is entirely done uh, here by our state and uh, fish and game biologists who advise us on the species um, population and ma they make judgments uh, with their rules. We have a process where not everything has to come through the legislature because that's a slow process. So we've given the fish and game department um, 
the ability to make rules that set seasonal limits and um, catching methods and come down to the point where they can actually close off bodies of water or change the methods of fishing within certain areas to best manage the inland side of things. Um, anything to add to that, Cherie? Uh, no, that was a pretty good cursory view of that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you for the explanation. So, uh, when there is, uh, you know, the fishermen need that uh, convey to your representative in here, uh, can you interfere the policy or decision to change the policy or regulation? We that's where the the activist groups and uh, such come into play. Um, if a, if the fishermen as an industry have an issue that they really feel needs to be addressed, they will together um, contact us and ask for legislation to be put in. Um, that will typically start with a draft piece of legislation from a handful of state representatives. Keep in mind, we have quite a lot at uh, 400 state representatives. Um, we are actually the third largest democratically elected body in the world. Um, so a handful of state reps would draft some legislation and then it would come to this committee and the fishermen would show up to testify why do they want this bill? What is the purpose? How's it gonna affect them? Sometimes, it is because of something they see that's coming out of the federal regulations that might cause them to lose their livelihood. And they want us to react to it as a state. And sometimes our hands are tied, but sometimes there's things we can do to allow uh, a balance between the needs of the fishermen and the demands for conservation from Washington or just in general, a rule from the uh, Atlantic States fisheries, uh, and that sort of thing. Anything else? Okay. So does that answer your question? I want to know as a scientist, uh, I'm interested in how you do the stock uh, assessment. So this is the, 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 the basic of information that you need to decide uh, something for the regulation. So who that uh, legitimate to do the research? Is it the university or some research agency? And then after that, when they process the data to who those information pass, so you can make regulation of all that. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question, actually. Um, we have biologists in fish and game in our department that work for them full time. Uh, part of their job is to survey the wildlife in the state that is uh, crucial towards towards uh, sportsmen and or our industries. Um, and then there's also the Atlantic Fisheries Council that I assume does some sort of uh, some surveying as well. And we've got the federal government always involved in trying to do some stuff as well. So it's I think there's multiple groups that come at this measurement. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to Cherie to explain more closely how we get all of our data. You did you did well, Mr. Chen. Um, it's it's uh, a combination of oh I should say a collaboration actually effort. Um, yes, within states, each state, there are various agencies that are responsible for natural resources um, or habitats, right? Uh, so we are constantly out surveying or sampling populations and such. Um, our sister agency, the Department of Environmental Services, will be out doing water quality uh, work so we can collaborate with them um, for data. You know, this is just part and parcel of all the data that's collected. Other states are doing the same. As well as, as uh, Chairman Splain indicated, the federal government is also. 
the the two organizations I mentioned, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the New England Fisheries Management Council, they also have staff that are responsible for data collection and analyses. So we all have uh, large responsibilities of monitoring what our uh, populations are doing, in including the migratory species. And that's the reason why you have these um, organizations and um, state agencies to be able to um, recommend or to base decisions on science and not something necessarily that is based on subjectivity from an industry or and such. What's really um, interesting and fascinating actually is when we do go through these processes, the industry does have um, input as we're going through policy or, or creating rules and regulations so that we do hear that, we do listen to that. But um, if science doesn't necessarily back up what the industry is uh, observing on their own, then there are decisions that have to be made through a policy procedure to assure that, or try to ensure we're not putting people out of business, that we can reach some sort of compromise where it's not going to affect the sustainability um, of their livelihoods as well as the fisheries and the populations. And do we get any of the data on fish populations and species populations that we're interested in out of the sportsmen and fishermen themselves? Or is this entirely driven by uh, our researchers and the researchers of these organizations? Oh, it is. Yes, it comes from everywhere, actually. Um, part of the surveys are can be done federally um, in collaborations with states. So we have a, um, a coastal survey that occurs in inland fisheries. Um, they primarily determine population um, and changes in population through their, their particular work of netting, um, you know, actually those sort of methods of uh, long-term data sets and, and the same methodology to create those uh, long-term data sets where stable data sets can create um, better data than sporadic data sets. Um, UNH, our university systems are also in part um, collecting data and providing, not necessarily towards stock assessments and such, but can provide um, questions for us to be able to maybe address if they're picking up something that, that state or federal agencies aren't picking up. But there are many surveys that are being conducted. Um, there's, there's all sorts of methodologies of, as you, as you probably are utilizing in your countries too, to um, assure that the data sets and the data that you're working with are going to be um, reliable and defensible because the industry relies on that. And it's very important that they have their input and that they have the confidence in the data that you are um, making decisions, policy decisions on. And do we have any current collaborations with UNH uh, for any of this? All the time, <laughs> all the time. Yeah, right now um, we're collaborating with a rainbow smelt project where UNH goes out and does work for us in the spring. Oh yeah, oh, you were? Sorry, just one quick statement. Would you say it's a fair statement to say that sometimes government can be cumbersome, but uh, Fish and Game and DES have the authority and latitude if they see some very uh, bad trends happening, they can't react very quickly. Yes, we can. We certainly try and do that, absolutely. 
Yeah, I'm curious about this uh, stock assessment you conduct in here. What is the boundary for the stock assessment in here? Are you divided between the state water and federal water or is it just uh, one stock for the uh, fisheries management area? For the stock? Um, it, it varies uh, de depending on, of course, the, the species. But yes, some of the... Uh, Coastal species or Atlantic Ocean species are divided up into stocks, absolutely, based on their area, based on um, DNA, you know, their genetics and such. We can make those determinations that when we do create policy um, and fisheries management that we are relying on um, maintaining stocks and not depleting one and, and not depleting another, right? You, we want to make sure that you keep stock separate when you make policy and management decisions. So could you give me an example for the stock that you conduct with the federal or with the uh, commission, something like that? The, the certain fisheries species, the fish species? Uh, let me see, Atlanta Cod. Um, we have uh, George's Bank stock and then we have a gulf of maine stock so when we make um, fisheries management decisions and when we do the sampling and such we make sure that we are sampling both stocks appropriately and efficiently so that um, we're managing both stocks based on uh, the data that's coming out of our surveys and work saya mau menu bahasa Indonesia, Pak. Uh, setelah melakukan banyaknya peraturan dan uh, undang. Okay. Yeah. Setelah melakukan uh, peraturan yang harus diikuti oleh uh, para pelaku penangkap ikan ataupun fishers game yang disebutkan tadi dan kemudian restorasi uh, saya ingin menanyakan uh, setelah mengimplementasikan peraturan tersebut uh, berapa presentasi keberhasilan dan uh, setelah uh, apa saya bilang ya peraturan yang diberlakukan presentasi keberhasilan ikan itu uh, berapa ya? presentasi keberhasilan ikan untuk restorasinya berapa persen kemudian apakah dapat memenuhi market dari pasar setelah mengimplementasikan peraturan-peraturan tersebut. Thank you. So that depends everything to do with species, right? Um, some species we've been successful, very successful with with implementing regulations that then allow us to still meet market requirements for the fishermen themselves. And in some areas, we've made the fishermen unhappy. Um, and I'll let Cherie talk about specific examples. But I think the cod was one of them, um, where we had to decrease on George's bank for a while, didn't we? Um, and there's We're, we're also seeing a uh, lessening in the number of species of what they were using as bait fish for our lobster traps. So they've switched bait species in my understanding as well. Um, the previously abundant, I don't remember what it was that there was a haddock, um, not so abundant now. So uh, Sometimes we're successful, sometimes it's not, and and I'm sure we've got some great examples of extremely good successes, and then we've got some examples of where we are still working on it. That's a really good question, and it's hard to um, it's hard to define, right? It's hard to answer in in all aspects. So under the Magnuson Stevenson Act. There is a requirement that you create fishery management plans and further ad ad amendments and addendums if need be in order to address um, restoration potential. So if you have a species or fishery that's um, overfishing or overfished, then you have a particular time limit that you need to... Um, restore them to to a particular time frame 
that was a viable fishery. Well, with climate change, um, our other uh, natural resource issues, that doesn't necessarily happen. So then you try during that time frame, say 10 year time frame of restoration, you try and continually adjust rules and regulations to, um, to manage the, the fishery, because that's all you can do. You can't manage uh, natural mortality, right? You can't manage what's happening in their environment to a large degree. So the, pretty much the only thing you can effectively manage is the fisheries themselves. So unfortunately, that's when you get into these issues that Chairman Splain was speaking of, where the industry is happy at times and not happy at other times because we're constantly having to adjust based on our annual or every three year stock assessment process that creates the data that informs us if, if we are still on track with our 10 year restoration plan, 10 year being an example, restoration plan or recovery plan. So it's, um, it's complex. And again, if, if their natural environment is changing such that it's something that the fisheries, um, it's not the fisheries fault that a uh, population necessarily is being uh, depleted. You can still only regulate the fisheries to make sure that it doesn't become even more depleted. And an example of that, as I mentioned earlier, is the northern shrimp. I think we're in our 13th or 14th year of a moratorium on the fishery. There's shrimp out there but they're at such low levels that it would not be able to sustain a fishery and their um, ecosystem services to the ocean. And I believe she had a part of her question where she was asking how we measure success. If we've actually restored, thank you, uh, if we actually restored them to their particular levels that we are trying to um, get them to in their 10 year period. So we always have um, an, a, a period of time that we know the populations and the fisheries uh, were doing well. So say there was a period of time in um, the 1990s that was a good population to support a particular um, amount of fisheries then we would try and restore it to that level. And that's what those, those fishery management plans try and do and try to adjust for um, based on how many people we have out there fishing for them, which could be uh, diminished or increased based on what the populations were before and how many individuals you had fishing on them. So you want to maintain a particular number of, of fishers or harvesters based on a particular population. If you increase the harvesters and still have this small population, then you're in an overfished issue. If you have the opposite where you've got um, the same amount of harvesters, but a declining uh, population, you still have the same problem of being overfished or overfishing is occurring. So you always want to maintain some level that you recognized as being successful or fully restored at some point based on the amount of fisheries that we're fishing on. Yes, sir. Uh, saya ingin ber, uh, bertanya, uh, kebetulan saya juga uh, menjadi salah satu tenaga ahli pada anggota DPR RI Komisi 4 uh, bidang perikanan di Indonesia. Saya rasa ini momen penting karena ada keterwakilan dari 
Dewan Perwakilannya, Legislatornya, kemudian ada dari Departemen Perikanan. Untuk pertama yang ingin saya tanyakan, uh, kalau di Indonesia itu fungsi Dewan Perwakilan Rakyat diantaranya adalah terkait pengawasan, regulasi, dan anggaran. Uh, itu bagaimana dengan uh, apa uh, posisi kerja yang berada pada uh, legislator yang ada di sini. Kemudian apakah uh, para anggota legislatif ini melakukan fungsi dan kemudian uh, menyerap aspirasi kepada nelayan atau reses dan memberikan bantuan melalui aspirasi, aspirasinya yang disalurkan melalui Departemen Perikanan. Terus yang kedua, berapa kalau berbicara pengelolaan perikanan berkelanjutan pasti dibutuhkan juga anggaran yang cukup. Nah, di sini bagaimana berapa dukungan anggaran yang diberikan oleh dewa, uh, legislatif kepada eksekutif, kepada Departemen Perikanan untuk uh, meningkatkan pendapatan asli daerah yang ada di sini. Kemudian untuk DPR sendiri bagaimana pengambilan keputusan karena dalam pengelolaan perikanan pasti ada hubungan antara legislatif kemudian eksekutif. Saya mungkin mewakili asosiasi perikanan yang, bagaima, yang sampai saat ini bagaimana memberikan edukasi dan mengadvokasi kepentingan nelayan. Kita mau lihat apakah legislatif yang di sini juga mengambil peran besar tanpa ada intervensi dari atau tekanan dari partai politik terkait dengan kegiatan-kegiatan aktivitas pemberdayaan nelayan. Mungkin seperti itu. Very good question. Um, we do decide the budget for fish and game, not this committee, the entire house. Um, and that budget actually goes in front of a different committee, the finance committee, um, for their determination as to whether it's okay and whether it needs more. When a certain special circumstance pops up, we may allocate funding in this committee to address a certain issue, um, we do not, as a legislature, we do not um, get involved in the market and the fishermen, aside from providing the guidelines under which they must work. So we're not directly financially tied into the results of our fishing, and we're not We don't have any impact on the revenue that fishing provides to the state aside from uh, our general guidelines that we provide for them. We don't do any kind of subsidies to the fishermen um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, if a federal regulation from Washington came down and said that uh, it was going to affect, say, the type of gear that everyone had to use, Well, then we would have to work to try to make sure that there was as little impact to our fishermen as possible while they transitioned into that gear. We usually don't do that through the act of subsidy where we would give them money to purchase the new gear, but more in making sure there's enough time available for them to move into the new gear from the old gear without impacting their operations. Uh, I think that the best situation that we have for all of that industry is that we in New Hampshire don't have a sales tax. So we don't have to concern ourselves with tax policy that might impact negatively our fishermen. Um, and that's probably why we're more of a hands-off when it comes to the industry. And we focus on funding the department that um, enforces and governs the, the regulations we've put in place. Uh, that makes the rules that are more nimble than the laws that we put in place. And um, I believe that we, as a partner to these other fisheries, there's there's contributions we make into that. Um, so now I'll, again, toss it over to Cherie. Thank you. Um, you, you explained it very well. Um, on a state level, there's very little opportunity to provide funds to to an industry um, that might be in trouble. However, because there's so much interaction with the federal government um, and these other organizations, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, that 
oftentimes there could be disaster funds available congressionally. There could be um, other funds available, federal funds that is, available to help the industry adjust to rules and regulations, whether that be monetarily or whether that be um, literally the um, government supplying funds for us to maybe buy the gear and, and provide it to the industry if there's gear change requirements. So it just depends on what the requirements are that might be um, affecting them. Um, and as to whether it's a disaster, um, the Atlantic hearing, which is um, Senator Splain, uh, Senator, uh, Representative Splain, I'm sorry, I just elevated him, um, indicated that we've had a collapse of the Atlantic hearing population in the Gulf of Maine. As a result, um, for bait species, uh, the lobster industry has had to move to uh, menhaden species, which is a very robust population along the East Coast now. And um, they harvest them for the use of bait because the regulations now to harvest Atlantic herring are very strict and very uh, constricting. So the state, um, as well as the other states between uh, Rhode Island and Maine declared to the federal government uh, that we wanted to see a fisheries disaster being declared. So that goes in front of Congress. Congress makes those decisions as to whether they will fund uh, fisheries disasters such as those. And then once all that clears uh, the federal process, then funds come to each state and the state disperses, uh, Fish and Game disperses those funds to those that were affected by uh, the diminished fishery capacity. Yes, sir. Just a quick question. A lot, I know a lot of Fish and Game's funding is self-funded through licenses from sportsmen and other things. What percentage of your overall budget, ballpark, is uh, self-funded and how much is coming from the legislature? Um, for Fish and Game, it is primarily a self-funded agency. We also um, have the opportunity to get um, for some of our, a lot of our work, federal funds through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA Fisheries and such. And that percentage, um, technically it's 75, 25, but it re in reality it is not. It's uh, a little bit less, you know, like 60, 40 percent uh, fish and game funds to, to federal funds. Um, it, it, fish and game struggles at times because we are constrained. We do have some general funds that comes to the department. Uh, for example, for search and rescue, because it's not just the uh, stakeholders, the fish and game stakeholders, your anglers, your hunters and such that are lost or need rescuing and such. So there is some general funds that come to Fish and Game, but it's uh, primarily a self-sourcing agency. And we get a bunch of money in the Pittman Act from purchase of uh, angling gear and hunting equipment, uh, ammunition and such, correct? Correct. Those are, those are where some of the federal funds come from, absolutely. Uh, saya ada pertanyaan uh, di dalam sorry uh, jika ada perpindahan ikan uh, misalkan dari New Hampshire ke uh, daerah uh, bagian lain apakah itu juga diatur uh, di dalam uh, uh, fish and game uh, itu sendiri uh, aturannya untuk perpindahan penjualan antara satu state ke state lainnya. Uh, kemudian bagaimana uh, 
representatif membuat aturan terkait ini. Uh, untuk memberi konteks di Indonesia jika ada penjualan ikan dari satu pulau ke pulau lain maka diperlukan uh, kerjasama uh, dan juga ada aturan terkait uh, jual beli antar daerah bagian nah uh, saya ingin tahu bagaimana uh, hal tersebut dilakukan di sini Oke okay, another good question um, the way that we govern um, the industry bringing fish into our state for sale is through the landing of the fish. If they bringing the fish into a port in New Hampshire, they have to be licensed to land the fish here, and they buy those licenses. We have, as the United States, something in our Constitution called the Commerce Clause, which prohibits one state from charging any kind of tariffs on another state for the importing or exporting of, of things between states. So there's absolutely no um, collaboration needed, even if it's a migratory species of fish, for a person who's licensed to land the fish in New Hampshire to then sell them to somebody who doesn't live here. And now again, I'll throw it to Cherie in case I missed anything there. Thank you. Um, so you've heard me speak about the council and the commission work, the ASMFC and the New England Fisheries Management Council. Those are made up of all the states. So when a, a fishery policy management decision is made, all of the states enact it. So they, they should be uh, the same up and down the coast. Uh, for where those where those fish species um, exist, an example would be um, I don't know striped bass, where um, everybody has the same regulation for harvest. Um, states can be more conservative than what the policy um, that all the states voted on have. But um, as for creating equal rules and regulations, that's what those organizations do. And as uh, Representative Splain uh, indicated, that um, a lot of times the rules and regulations for commerce come into effect as to how um, they can be um, discluded or included based on commerce rules. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question for Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to know how important is uh, the fisheries industry for New Hampshire and uh, how is the percentage of fisheries comparing to the other industry? And I'm sure it's going to impact uh, for the state to make the priority for any fisheries uh, policies. Thank you. So the fisheries in New Hampshire are not our biggest industry in New Hampshire, but the lobster industry is our biggest fishery in New Hampshire uh, as far as the dollar amount that it brings into the state. Um, and I would say that uh, probably number one, we might be up there with paper and timber. Um, Anybody else got any idea what our other top industries are? I know we've got a huge blossoming uh, biomed industry now, uh, and the high tech has always been uh, doing well, and it's doing better now that there's more remote working. Um, Representative Ming, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I believe it's the medical industry. I, I think that, that might be our top one. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Rep Willette? I know in the, the northern half of the state, it's the tourist industry is really the largest industry. I almost forgot tourism. I mean, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, we, we're we blessed here with a, a multi-seasonal tourist industry. In other words, in the winter time, we don't shut down completely. We shift our tourism to ski areas and winter sports, uh, winter activities like ice fishing and things that people do in the outdoors. Um, and then in the summertime, it's, of course, summer tourists, hiking, uh, tourism throughout all of our mountain ranges, plus also on the seacoast. 
uh, although as we mentioned, the water stays pretty darn cold, so it, swimming is not a big thing. Even in even in our warmest months, it's still cold enough that you um, you'll get goosebumps when you go in the water. Um, yeah, but I'd, I'd say lobster is. Do you know how many how, what the dollar amount is approximately? Uh, it's in the five million dollar range for just landings that doesn't include the economics associated with the infrastructure and such five million is only for lobster or all the fisheries that would be just the lobster portion i believe so um it's probably down around our fourth or fifth probably i would say the fisheries and we have a very short coastline of all the new england states we've got the shortest um and so it's uh what 16 miles or something like that 18. yeah if you want to stretch it it's 18. and if we count the all around the isle of shoals we can add in a couple um it's very short so um that's why we don't have large-scale um fisheries of other types we don't have a lot of um fisheries that choose to have a uh a presence on our seacoast that go out into those international waters or into the the deep uh, federal waters to do the deep sea net fishing or any of that. And we've got very strict regulations on how nets can be used along our coastline. So um, that's why it ends up being the lobster that brings in the most. Uh, it's, it's the one that's constantly going year round. Um, the other ones tend to be um, smaller in nature uh, compared to the neighboring states. Although we do have, I think it's the smallest coastline in the United States. Rhode Island is a little bigger than we are. So, yes, we have the smallest coastline in the U.S. here in New Hampshire. But I think it's important. It may not just be a, a, a dollar figure. A, a lot of people come here because of the coastline. And a lot of those people that are coming here are recreational fishermen. And, of course, that... that spins off to boat sales and all of those other spinoffs that happen because of the folks coming here to do the fishing. So you may not, because it's such a small coastline, you may not be able to just compare the, the money exactly compared to the rest of the state, but it's a, it's a really important piece of what New Hampshire is, is our coastline and the attraction that it has for people to come here. Um, I, I, and, and I think a lot of these are great questions for Wednesday afternoon when you're going to see the Yankee Fisherman's Cooperative, uh, yeah. who would have maybe slightly different uh, ideas than we do here. I want to share uh, something that uh, may be quite different in our country. So in your, in the state, maybe or in this in this nation, Individual fishermen should have a permit, yeah. So in Indonesia, when you go to Indonesia, then you don't need a permit to do fishing. So you can fishing all you want. You can catch all you want. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we didn't uh, count that, uh, that uh, stock assessment for that because um, because uh, fishermen uh, sometimes they get the fish, uh, the, the, the individual who are fishing, and sometimes they didn't care if they did get the fish. This this wasting time for that, and then also some uh, practice that uh, some people who do the aquaculture, they do something like a charity when they release uh, some uh, of their uh, larvae or uh, the fry to the to the nature, even though they didn't assess also the survival rate does those uh, uh, fish alive or, or not but uh, they, they do that for generous to the generosity to the to the nature so yeah maybe uh, this is this, this different part because we still didn't get direct effect to the uh, uh, how to say the global warming and uh, season changing and so on but uh, I'm sure in the future, those will happen also in us in the tropic area. So that make me uh, make me build a, a one of concern that uh, we in Indonesia should start anticipating and regulate somehow 
in order to sustain because uh, we cannot just uh, relay on just uh, relax and so on and so on because when those happen maybe already too late to to our country so yeah very great information for for you all to me thank you yeah that's very interesting um i would say that without a huge buy in of cooperation it is almost impossible to um manage species even if you have the data unless you know how many people are fishing and you have uh somehow permitted them and i'm not going to advocate for indonesia to start charging fishermen for licenses however uh a, a voluntary registration of uh who's fishing and what they're fishing for gives you data that allows you to then balance out where you need to expend your effort and monitor more closely the species um and so so i would say that uh, without that kind of data it's very difficult you can have all of the info on the fish numbers that you want from surveying them but if you don't know how many people are fishing for them uh you're missing a big key point there uh, i remember that many years back you did not need a license at all if you were fishing in new hampshire in the ocean the federal government put down a uh, a permit requirement and now you need a license to fish in the ocean as well as in our inland waters that we've always charged a license fee for and that license fee not only protects the habitat and the uh, fish hatcheries and such but it allows them to know how many people are fishing and um, make sure that people are following guidelines uh, as far as how many fish a day they can take and such. Um, Cherie, you're up. Sorry, to the, uh, just want to make clear the explanation from the Mr. Henke that so in our back home, uh, so for the small scale, at least for the artisanal fisheries, they don't need a license, but they have still uh, to report their catch and we also have the system for that and then for the small airport i'm sorry for the industrial scale they need a permit to get the fishing so you are true that the data is very very important for us to manage the fisheries and then uh i have a question for uh for you in here uh i don't know whether you uh, apply the quota system or not and then uh if you apply the quota. I hear from uh, previous uh, day before that they have to pay for the uh, quota before they go fishing. And then what I want to know, uh, how do you set, uh, how do you charge uh, the number of amount that uh, they have to pay for the quota? Let's say for headache, let's say uh, is uh, $2 per pound or something like that. Thank you. Are, are you talking about commerce? Yeah, <laughs> but I was the commerce. Don't, you know, we don't regulate commerce. We don't. So I, am I am I misinterpreting this? If, if I interpret it correctly, if, if we put a quota on on fishermen, that they can only take in a certain amount. How do we charge for that? How do we how do we charge for our licensing that allows them to take in? And where do we cap a quota? At, uh, do we have quotas, too, was a question in there. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, do we have quotas? Do we have, um, limits that they can hit annually and they can't do anymore? Uh, they have to switch to another species. If these things, uh, how are they charged as well? Do we charge people by how many pounds they bring into the, in based on the, and that, is that how their licensing is done or is it done as a, uh, flat fee licensing system? Those were the questions as far as I could tell. Thank you for that. Um, it's, it's flat fee. Essentially, our licenses are issued um, based on what the department needs, <laughs> essentially. And I know we have but, a commercial level, yeah. We but have... then we've also got some personal ones. So th that's a breakdown. It's flat for commercial fishermen, and it, then it's another fee, separate, different one if you're just a personal, private fisherman. Um, 
we we also have just permits where they don't have to pay at all. It's just you know like a registration system and such. But it it's um, no, it's not based on on what they're coming in with or what they're landing. It's just based on um, actually what the department feels it needs for its income as well as what the public can bear. So, go ahead. Doesn't each of our licenses carry with it a limit on take for most of them? So each, if I go fishing, I can only take X amount of trout per day of X size, but it it doesn't connect to funding the department. But there are limits. Yes, there are limits. There are quotas. Uh, again, primarily based on um, what a population can withstand for a harvest. It it's not um, it's not based on income for the department or for the state. It's it's based on, the quotas are based on what the populations can handle for fishery, um, fisheries that are fishing off of it and still maintain a sustainable population and a sustainable fishery. And as far as commercially, Cherie, do we have a cap on what a commercial fisherman can land per day or per month or per season? Uh, you know, it depends on the species. Um, again, through our collaborative uh, organizations and such, yes, there, there can be quotas uh, placed on commercial, some commercial industries. Um, there could be a limit on how many uh, licenses are available to to be able to fish you know that's a type of quota also again you know when you're when you're trying to maintain a sustainable population it's the population and the number of, of uh, fisheries that are going after that population you can only you can only control the fisheries you can't control natural mortality or that sort of issue so there's several ways of uh, controlling fisheries, whether that be quotas, whether that be the number of uh, licenses that are allowed to fish for, th for those species and such. So to tie this all up with a nice little bow, we have a department that is essentially self-funded through license fees. That is our fish and game wildlife management department. And they determine license pricing for everything that has to do with needing a license from hunting to the fishing aspect based on what the department needs to balance their budget also taking into account what is somebody willing to pay for a license if the price goes too high you'll have less of them and now you've got a problem with managing the species that's that end then we have the quota ends which is usually one of those data points that's a collaborative effort with the um, associations that we belong with for the Atlantic Seacoast and for the North Atlantic states. And that might mean that we're not issuing as many licenses for commercial fishermen because we have a problem. We might put a quota on how many they can take in in a season, but we don't charge them based on what they bring in they pay the flat rate for the license and the ability to fish. So in your case, is that what Indonesia does? If, if, I, if I bring in 100 pounds of fish, I have to pay this much, and if I bring in 1,000 pounds of fish, I have to pay more? Is that what you do? Yeah. So in our back on uh, if you want to go fishing, you have a, need a license and a permit. Uh, and then the permit is depend on the how much or how bigger the uh, vessel do you use for, uh, in terms of the commercial fishing, you know. And it's uh, based on the uh, productivity of the fishing gear and the vessel. So the relation between gear and the vessel, and then we calculate based on the gate, the gross ton. Let's say you have the vessel 100 gross tons. It uh, costs uh, maybe 
uh, expensive for the vessel with the uh, more larger size, then they should pay more expensive for for the permit. And right now we try to turn uh, transform from the uh, what we saw in, what we call in here is like a landing fee. So right now we uh, uh, apply the program for the landing fee. They uh, the permit is free, and then when they catch the fees, they get the fees, and then we charge ten uh, percent for that. Yeah. Okay, so it is a bit different. Yeah, it's essentially like a, a tax on the amount of productivity you have. Um, yeah, that's why I wonder in here how much the fishermen uh, pay for the permit or license. What, what does a commercial fishing license go for right now? Um, I'd have to look that up, but uh, for non-residents... Um, a commercial license, uh, commercial saltwater license might be, I think it's $500 for a, for a resident. I think it's 300. Um, there's, there's some graduations of, um, of some commercial licenses, our lobster industry, you have your, your 1200 trap, you have your 600 trap, you have your 100 trap and you have your recreational. So you have these graduations based on, on that, um, you know, it, it varies. That's based on the size of the fishing organization. So if I've got a lobster boat and I'm only going to put out 600 traps, I buy the 600 trap license and anything up to 600 traps I can do for that flat fee. Okay. And if I'm running a bigger operation with two boats and I need 1,200, now I'm buying the 1,200 license and I can go up to 1,200 traps. It's still a flat fee price for the license and we don't have a tax in New Hampshire for sales or any of that so um, we don't charge them when they bring them in um, the fee is strictly for the license for the ability to go out and then of course they're subject to enforcement so if they get fishing game comes up alongside they're going to make sure they're not taking short lobsters they're not taking lobsters with eggs um, they're not they're not uh, breaking any other rules regarding the way that they're putting their traps out or any of that stuff. Um, so we don't uh, uh, enfor not enforce. We don't inspect the landings, correct? You, you sometimes fish and game enforcement will go out to make sure they're following the law, but we don't inspect the landings and count every amount that is brought in by each license holder we have we have uh data collection programs that we will intercept boats on docks and gather data on some but um it's up to the individual harvester uh, and the dealer to report particular data but no we don't literally go out there we don't meet them in and count every fish that comes off it's the dealer um, that supplies us with the actual landings data and it's a harvester that supplies us with the effort data you know that they went out for 12 hours um, with this particular gear came in with this estimate number of of harvest so that we can assess effort involved in the uh, landings of those species. Mr. Chairman? So so if I'm on the Quam Flats, uh, I don't know what the limit is. It used to be a five-gallon pail, and I take two five-gallon pails, I'm not going to meet a game warden when I'm coming off the game flats or the Quam Flats? Of course you will. <laughs> right. Do you want me to set it up for you? <laughs> So when we have our landings inspected by Fish and Game, what they're doing is they're collecting data and they're looking for violations of the regulations, okay? They're not charging fees. Um, the only thing that happens at the landing as far as a fee goes is you've got a, a dealer who's agreed to buy the fish and you've got a fisherman who's supplying the fish and that's a private deal between them. 
The state doesn't take any money out of that deal at all. But what we do is we collect the data from the fishermen and the data from the dealers. And that's how we add to our big bucket of data that allows us to determine how the species are being managed. We have 10 minutes left if anybody wants to uh, ask anything else. Uh, uh, I have a question, but this is maybe like out of the fisheries topic. So this morning, my interpreter uh, I mentioned to us some interesting fact that we want uh, just to know. Uh, is it okay to ask? <laughs> so you can ask us uh, anything. Yeah, yeah. We heard the fact that uh, you, as a representative, is the one who paid very high in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, based on the interpreter uh, mentioned to us, <laughs> we, as so a sorry. as a state representative yes. in New Hampshire, you earn a hundred dollars a year. Really? That's it. And that's before taxes and before you buy your business cards and your ties and anything else. That's, that's why I don't have a tie. I'm broke. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, yes, uh, because we have 400 state representatives, as I mentioned, we're the third largest democratically elected English speaking body in the world. Yeah. Um, and if we, it's in our constitution. And uh, it's been there since the 1800s or so with it. They got paid $100 a year for their service. Wow. And uh, none of us is going to go there and change the Constitution to get paid more. So we're strictly a volunteer legislature. Mm -hmm. We all have our day jobs or we're retired or what have you. Wow. And, uh, and we do not make any money at all. We have no staff. As a chairman, I have an office that I share with the vice chair and, and another committee chairman. So um, most everybody here just has a drawer and a file cabinet, and that's it. Um, and that's it's a good question. Um, but uh, <laughs> if you go to other states, you'll find that they're some of the highest paid uh, people around, but not in New Hampshire. Yeah, because it's uh, different from, yeah, we, we just know. <laughs> maybe if we started charging them by how many pounds of fish they brought up, we could <laughs> pay everybody more, but we don't do that. Um, and how does it work in, in Indonesia? Uh, it's quite different. Yeah, they, they already have regulation for setting up the uh, representative cost and salary and so on. It's charged by our own tax. Yeah. I, I'd follow up. I think this is my first term here. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of pride in all the representatives here that we are a volunteer group. We take that as a very, it's a very personal yes. thing. And there's a lot of pride here that we aren't here for the money and that we're here for, yes. for our citizens. And it's, um, in fact, we, the, it was brought up to give us a raise this year and we voted that down because of the, the economic wow. conditions. But, uh, and we had the conversation that if we were to get paid a lot more money, it would change the whole feel of this place and the way that people respond, we think. For example, I'll throw out there, um, it's not just us. The senators, there's 24 of them, and they only get paid $100 a year as well. We don't need term limits because most people can only handle being here for free <laughs> for a certain amount of time, and then they decide, I'm done, and someone new runs, okay? Wow. Uh, it's, it's not an elected for life type of thing because nobody wants to do this forever for $100 a year. <laughs> and um, every two years, our entire government in New Hampshire is reelected. Huh. From the governor straight down to us, the only offices that are different are the federal offices because they follow federal law for their terms, their length of terms. But the governor, the executive council, the Senate, and uh, the state representatives here in the, in the House of Representatives are all elected every two years. Wow. So if you think you made a mistake, in two years you get to vote them out and get somebody new. <laughs> and I will say I am one of the crazies here. I've been here 25 years. So. Wow. <laughs> but when you, uh, I notice you're going to be doing a tour of the State House uh -huh. this afternoon. You'll get to see the House chambers where all 400 of us sit. Wow. And we are 
put in like sardines into a room with oh. our chairs <laughs> side by side. Um, you'll find it interesting. So I'm still curious. Uh, you earn a hundred dollar a year, but does the government give you like incentive for the operational costs or the uh, facilities like car or super special private jet or whatever? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so I'll start out by saying that um, we get paid a hundred dollars a year. I'm not sure that every state rep earns the hundred dollars a year. <laughs> there, there's a number that they don't even earn it. But um, on top of that, I will say that uh, we do get free tolls. We get to drive through the tolls without paying. Um, so that's like saving a dollar when you go through, you know, each time. Um, and we have uh, mileage that we get paid. Uh, so uh, it's done at the federal rate, which is 65 cents a mile or something like that. And the state house knows where we live and where the state house is. So for the round trip to come from our house to the state house and back, we get paid for the mileage of the days that we have to come in here. Um, it's enough for me to essentially buy me a lunch on a day that, that I come in um, or pay for that gas that I had to use to come in. But um, there's no other perks. Uh, as I mentioned, we pay for our own business cards. Um, even the special license plates we put on our car, we got to pay extra for those. So, uh, yeah. Yes. And mine's, mine's a special one because this one was made with the, the state seal. And now we have two state seals in New Hampshire. One is the corporate seal, which has the boat, and one is the non-corporate seal, the original seal. And that's the one here that's got uh, a bundle of arrows, a pine tree, and uh, a fish. And this is the original seal before the state was incorporated. And the, the person who used to make these was a representative who passed away some five years ago. So you can't get one of these anymore. Thanks for sharing. Any other questions? They don't have to be fish and game related. We're, we've got five minutes and... We can certainly do that.